Welcome back all. It's my pleasure to introduce Sam Quinn. Sam is a security researcher on McAfee's advanced threat research team with a focus on IoT and embedded devices. His talk is titled Student Monitoring Software Flunks Security and we'll dive into how security vulnerabilities and student monitoring software can be used to achieve remote code execution. Uh, thanks a lot, Sam. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, as Matt said, I've been on the, the uh, McAfee's Advanced Threat Research team for about two years now. And uh, yeah, I'll walk you through some of the vulnerabilities I found last year on a student monitoring software. So um, you should be seeing my slides here. Um, so yeah, enough about me. Let's uh, let's get into it. Um, like many industries, uh, every year, year there's more and more cyber attacks that are getting reported. Um, and one of the things that we discovered is, you know, K through 12 school districts are are um, not an exception to that. So one of the things as um, offensive security researchers that we like to do is try to put our minds in the set uh, or <laughs> set our minds just like a, an attacker would by um, looking at industries and, uh, and software targets that would be impactful for um, you know, uh, them to attack and potentially either use ransomware or whatever to um, extract, you know, extort them or whatever. So what we did here was we, we decided to look into a, you know, we knew that a lot of people were going to transition to schooling from home, uh, hybrid learning kind of thing. So we, we wanted to kind of dive into this um, this industry since we haven't had any research uh, in this like vertical before. And that's kind of when we started to look for um, software in this space that had um, a large user base. This is the same kind of idea what an attacker would probably do. They would, if they're putting um, the upfront effort, they would want to have the and most victims as they could possibly have. And that's what um, brought us to NetApp Vision Pro. It is a student monitoring software, um, and it is used by 6 million um, teachers and stud students alike in around 9,000 plus school districts. Um, the NetApp parent company is actually, um, has quite a few more products, and they uh, encompass around 100 million users. So not a small company at all, but um, this kind of seemed to fit our, our bill of trying to um, figure out kind of what an attacker would like to also see if they if they uh, invested their time into it. Um, and to kind of highlight on the, um, the reason we started to do this in 2020 was we, like I mentioned before, started to notice the trend of um, people starting to borrow school district owned computers, uh, connecting to you know, networks outside of the walled garden of the district owned network where there's a security team and and uh, IT professionals that help set up and secure those networks. Um, one, uh, NetApp Vision Pro is actually not really designed for remote learning or hybrid learning necessarily, but um, uh, with the uh, COVID-19, um, a lot of schools we, we identified were starting to take these devices, uh, lend them out, and then um, the students would bring these devices uh, home or to the coffee shop or whatever, and the software wasn't uninstalled. You know, they, they, they probably kept the same software set. So um, it's opening up a lot of these uh, software suites that are kind of really meant to be local only or um, confined in the district network, kind of getting a broader attack vector um, uh, outside of their, their, uh, their security there. So let me kind of explain a little bit more of how this software is used in the in the real world. Um, it is a kind of a student management software where a teacher can perform a handful of administrative tasks on the entire classroom. So if you can imagine if you're um, one teacher and you have to control a whole, a whole uh, computer lab of kids um, trying to not play games and whatnot, uh, this, this helps with that. So they can blank the screen to make sure they're focusing up front. Um, the teacher can actually remote control individual computers. Um, they can block web access, for instance, um, and then they can even start applications or remotely log in or reboot the computer. Um, one thing that caught our eye was the this software is installed at um, as a system service, 
and um, mostly to be tempo resistant, I would say. <laughs> you know, if it runs at a higher privilege than the student, they can't just um, use uh, the process explorer and close it or whatever. So um, that's kind of why they, I think we they did that. And then it's also started at boot, so the student can't, you know, just not start it. Um, it, it is started as the computer starts. And this is kind of to highlight a little bit back on if they're taking this computer out of the network, there's really no way for the um, unless the uh, administrator went to each computer individually and like disabled the service or uninstalled it, this would most likely still be running on those lent out computers um, that the students would bring home or whatnot. So um, this kind of piqued our attention. And uh, but um, let's uh, let's put on our hack and shoes and dive into some of the technical details here. Um, the uh, um, one uh, <laughs> going into any project, uh, it's good to lay out some some uh, some fundamental um, goals to hit on, and these are trying to still be in that mindset of an attacker, um, where we want to have um, multiple different things where we would hit on the same as what they would probably uh, also try to hit on. So we wanted to have a local network attack since this software isn't really designed to be going over the the internet. Um, we wanted to see if we could remote control the students, um, either with uh, like a uh, remote code execution or RDP or something like that. And we wanted to see if we could compromise potentially Windows accounts, um, uh, get passwords or, or whatnot. And then uh, since it is started as a system service, we wanted to see if we could escalate our privileges um, and improve our position on the machine. So we began by actually just once we identified this as our target, we went to their website and they actually offered a free 30-day trial, which to an attacker is an infinite <laughs> trial. <laughs> um, and so we uh, we kind of just downloaded that. I, I There's nothing against free trials. I actually personally like them a lot, but it does give um, you know attackers and, and researchers like myself a uh, pretty quick access to the software to begin reverse engineering and uh, kind of figuring out how they work in the back end. Um, the next thing we did was we set up a test environment. We wanted to emulate the uh, the, the student and the teacher's uh, environment as best we could. So we, we created a handful of VMs. We made one the teacher and the rest students. Um, and at this point, we're really trying to um, identify in the setup if there's any ch uh, different ways to configure the software. Um, there's nothing worse than finding a vulnerability in something and then realizing that during the installation, you unchecked security or something, you know? So we were kind of at this point still trying to make sure that we're setting it up in a way that is valid. And if we found a vulnerability in it, it would apply to um, the, uh, the real school districts that are using this. And then uh, we started to just start poking around. So <clears throat> we opened up the teacher console here. That's what this screenshot is. and started to try to I, narrow down our scope of what is hackable. Uh, we wanted to try to find a lot of these um, different uh, actions here, what, how they kind of work in the background, which ones would be interesting to look at from an attack vector and, and things like that. Uh, a lot of people think that you know hacking is just all command line in the basement um, uh, with, with a hoodie on, but <laughs> a lot of it's actually just trying to understand the software enough to actually find where there may be vulnerabilities. And that's, we spend a lot of time here doing is trying to just find out how these all work. Um, and so after that, we kind of just made a, a little diagram here of what was going on and identified uh, binaries and kind of how they're communicating in the, and one thing we noticed was the student and the teacher had quite different installs actually. So the student would actually have, they share one um, application between the two um, that was similar between both installs. Uh, but the student also had a lot of these, um, these plugins that would actually facilitate many of the actions shown in the previous slide. So for instance, if the teacher wanted to blank the screen, there, there's actually like a plugin for that, which is a completely different executable. Um, so we kind of wanted to identify the ones that we wanted to look at. Um, and so we kind of li listed them out here to just get a a global zoomed out view of the these two installs. And one thing I wanted to point out is the student, yeah, like I mentioned before, is running as system and the teacher is only running as the, the teacher user, uh, the Windows user. So 
Um, this kind of made us want to target the students more. There would probably be more of them, uh, more of them leaving the school network and uh, potentially have that remote or that privilege escalation um, because it, the software is running as system. Um, so now let's, uh, let's enumerate through some of our goals and see how we approached these um, uh, in our research. So the first thing we wanted to look at is how the local network uh, was set up and how the teacher and the student communicate between each other. Um, pretty quickly, we actually found that um, doing a Wireshark capture and just kind of playing around with some of those buttons um, that almost, yeah, everything was uh, sent in plain text. So this software was really designed for local network communication and never really um, uh, went through the, the extra steps to encrypt the traffic. So you can see here, um, even the sensitive data like um, logging into the student computer from the teacher console uh, would actually display the Windows username and password in plain text. Um, so easily just to uh, sniff the traffic on the network and just pull those off. Um, and uh, <laughs> so well, we noticed that and not only the Windows credentials, but like yeah, for instance, when the teacher was um, can start applications on these students remotely, that was also set in plain text, um, which really caught our eyes. An attacker um, trying to get you know code to execute on a uh, remote computer. This would be great to just capture this traffic and potentially replay it. Um, as well as when the students connect, um, they actually also start uh, broadcasting their screenshots. So highlighted here in the red box, those are like semi real time view of the students they start you know broadcasting out their like screens every few seconds and just being on the network uh, using a, a network sniffer um, that can extract images like driftnet for instance on linux we were able to just pull these uh, images um, by just uh, having a passive uh, listening you know uh, pre presence on the network um, so that uh, was so now we can fill in a little bit of more of that diagram. And so we can we can identify some of the network traffic and which is all unencrypted. Um, so that was uh, good to know. <laughs> and that actually led us to our first CVE finding where um, they, we filed it against uh, clear text transmission of sensitive data um, because the teacher was sending uh, even Windows credentials as well as commands and, and screenshots. Uh, we we, I did, we thought that was um, sensitive information that should have been uh, probably encrypted or um, obfuscated in some way. Um, and to kind of highlight on how easy it was just to get to that point, all the attacker would need to do is have access to the network where the student computer was on, um, have a Wi-Fi card or a network card that supports like promiscuous mode, and then pretty much just sniff the traffic with either Wireshark or DriftNet. And, and you'd be able to capture um, everything I showed before. Um, so if we look back at our goals, uh, we didn't get a local network attack since we're not really attacking anything, we're kind of just listening, but we did, we were able to compromise Windows uh, accounts that way. So um, that kind of checked off one of our goals there. Um, but uh, if we uh, kind of just recap, all we did was um, we had access to the software to the free trial, we set up you know, some mock classroom, um, uh, we identify that all network traffic was unencrypted. Uh, the teachers have full control over the students. They, uh, the students can't really deny these requests from the teacher. Um, the teacher wants to start you know, an application or view their screen. The, the students have no way of blocking that. And all of the students run as systems. So um, that's kind of where we're at at this point in our project. And, and then we wanted to um, really dive into seeing how many of those functions that the teacher can perform uh, we wanted to see if we could just emulate some of those or you know become a teacher a little bit to um, uh, an attacker a lot of those functions would be quite useful um, being able to start remote code ex or start applications uh, view the screenshots things like that so we wanted to think like the person we wanted to become and, and we wanted to become a teacher so we uh started to look into how um, difficult it would be to emulate some of that network traffic and <clears throat> you know kind of move it into a Python script or something more extensible that we can uh, build exploits and, and kind of work from there on. 
Um, and like I mentioned before, uh, the reason we wanted to do this was <clears throat> teachers control the students uh, with uh, no discretion. So the students, no matter what time it is, it doesn't have to be class time or anything. Like if a teacher wants to connect to a student computer that has the software running, the, the student computer will do it. Um, there, there's no way for them to deny it or they'd probably do that in the classroom. Um, yeah, and like I said before, the just having access to many of those teacher functions could be very useful for a, a, um, an attacker as well. So the next thing we had to do is see how the teacher found these students. Um, and uh, you can see maybe a, a, a trend coming up here where uh, um, all that, you know, like the traffic was just in plain text, really helping us out as an attacker. Um, the student actually broadcasts out their presence on the network every few seconds even. So uh, really quick, they're, they're constantly beaking out not only their computer name, but their IP address and their MAC address even. So kind of everything an attacker would need to do to just sniff on the network just for a short amount of time and kind of curate a list of these potential targets where a, <clears throat> an attacker could kind of enumerate through them all and potentially um, perform these teacher at, uh, actions um, uh, via emulation. So now that we have um, the, <clears throat> uh, the student list kind of, we, we know how to identify them on the network. We wanted to see how we could actually connect to them. So the way we did that was we started to um, capture multiple handshakes from different students, different teachers, and kind of compare them to see what was similar, what was different. And we identified the handshake as being like 11 packets. So quite a bit more complex than the standard uh, like TCP four-way handshake. It's, um, and, but however, through our, um, our, our diffing of these, these packet captures, we, we actually only identified three elements that were unique. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll go into those in a little bit, but um, I also wanna point out that right before the red box, there's actually two UDP messages and in this scenario, actually, the teacher is the listening socket and the students are the, um, the, connect, the ones that actually do the connection. So the teacher actually broadcasts out a UDP message and then the students respond acknowledging that UDP message and then actually connect to the teacher. So it was pretty easy to, for us to set up a like, listening socket and then just beacon out this UDP message and get these students to connect back to us. Um, but to go back to those unique elements, we, we needed to have those to actually have a successful handshake. And um, what we identified was one of them was a, a unique identifier for each teacher, um, which is pretty easy to identify. And then the second one was unique to each student. So also pretty easy to identify just through the, um, the network packet sniffing. And the third one really stumped us for the majority of our research actually until uh, you know, spending hours in, in, in WinDebug, where we actually ended up noticing that the token um, started to look quite familiar. So the token three, when we actually ran it through like the address command, we actually found that it was a heap address on the student that they were just actually broadcasting out to the teacher for some reason over the network. Um, I don't know if they were trying to just defeat ASLR on themselves or whatnot, but we thought that was pretty comical where um, they were using just a heap address as like a unique uh, identifier or something. So once we had that kind of understood and we could um, capture all of these uh, three tokens, we were kind of right on our way to creating some code to emulate this. So on the left here, these are uh, scapy layers where we can um, create custom network um, protocols, uh, I would say. And we did that for this. So we, we kind of reverse engineered these packets. Not everything, we actually knew what they did. So you can actually see a lot of these UKWs, which are unknowns. But um, since it was pretty much a, a static replay of, the, of those, we didn't really need to figure out what they did very much. So um, these are just a few of the packets. And then this is kind of code over here to show how simple it is that we, um, to replay these, these packets. We, all we really needed to do is change those tokens and the target IP. And everything else was pretty much static from just 
uh, the packet that we captured. Um, and then this one, so this is a run command uh, function and all we have to do is at the end, change which command we want it to run. And I'll kind of show you that in this demo here. Um, so these are all students, these Windows boxes, um, and this is the attacker script. Um, and so what it's doing right there is it's scanning the network just for five seconds and it actually found all of these computers via a broadcast. And then what we did is we ran PowerShell. So we'll do it again here with calculator this time. So there again, it's scanning the network just for five seconds. And in that time, these all of these students have broadcasted their IP address, their MAC address, and their student computer. And what we're doing here is just um, pretty much a, a direct replay of those packets from the teacher. Um, however, just changing which application we want to start. And it is, um, you know, executing on all of the students uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty nicely. <laughs> so that was that was a great um, finding right there for us. So that was our second CVE where we identified it as incorrect authorization. Since the student has no way of really identifying if a teacher is really their teacher and not just a Python script or whatever, there's there's no way for the student really to have any control over that. So um, if they have the software installed, which they can't uninstall since they probably don't have system or administrative access uh, and a Python script comes along, um, that anything that we tell it to, to run would get ran. So if we sync back up on our goals, we've actually accomplished quite a bit already um, pretty early on in the project. So we, we actually have now a local network attack where we can execute commands on the, the student machines um, we, after we found them and identified which ones are vulnerable. Um, we can remote control the student uh, you know, over remote code execution. Um, and then we still have the Windows account compromise. But um, you know, we still wanted to potentially increase our, uh, our, our position on these, these machines, knowing that uh, many students would probably not have the greatest privileges. Uh, having access to a student account or code execution as a student is not that, um, that uh, impactful. So um, to summarize a little bit more, um, we can passively identify these, these students on the network. We can spoof the handshake by capturing all of those unique elements. Uh, we can modify and replay the network traffic since there's no authentication or validation. Um, and we can execute arbitrary commands on these remote machines. So let's dive into the privilege escalation for a little bit. And so uh, to kind of bring it back to those calculators that were shown in the last um, demo, so those were all actually started as the student user. So there was code in place, um, which I'll show in a second, of that uh, where the system level service is actually identifying the, the student user and dropping privileges. So all of the plugins are still run as system services. So you can see like the screenshot viewer, the chat application, remote controlling, all of that is ran as system to prevent the student from like closing it or you know, denying the, the teacher. Um, however, they are um, any kind of like execution where we're, we're starting an application or opening a file, they did a great job of actually dropping the privileges uh, correctly. So um, it is good to see. However, it's bad um, <laughs> for, you know, an attacker or a researcher like me. So we, we still, we wanted to keep digging. And that's when we kind of dove into some of the reverse, I mean, the, uh, disassembly and wanted to try to find um, how that was getting handled. So on the left here, you'll see that um, this is all wrapper code for the system level service to identify which lo users logged in and then drop the privileges before running like shell execute somewhere down here. Um, there is this path over here that just goes straight to shell execute, clearly skipping all of this privilege uh, or these this user finding and, and whatnot. Um, so this really was what we wanted to get at. Um, however, it was somewhere up above. Um, it was reading a variable from like the registry once, and we didn't find any code to like set that variable, especially not over the network. So um, that was kind of a dead end there, but it really got us wondering how many other shell executes are there and do they all have this wrapper code um, you know, uh, around it? <clears throat> And that's kind of when we identified actually 
uh, four local privilege escalations. Um, none of these were actually available over the network, so that was uh, good on their part. Um, but you can see right here that this is a shell execute call with clearly non, none of that wrapper code. So um, this is the support page. So if you right click on the icon and go to about and then like support, it uh, opens Internet Explorer actually as system with a pre-filled URL. And in as soon as anything's running a system like that, um, there's there's many ways to even just use your mouse and click around, you know, save as and go to system 32 and open CMD or whatnot and, and kind of get a local privilege escalation that way. And so we kind of identified those in uh, not only the support page, but a few of the other plugins as well, um, all kind of just using <clears throat> the mouse only. So um, pretty impactful for them, not really for a, an attacker like us, but you know, students, if they knew how to do this, could um, uh, have system level access. So we disclosed this um, to them as incorrect privilege assignment since um, they, they should have had that wrapper code around these calls as well. Um, so that was our, our third find, or yeah, third finding there. So, um, but we still wanted to do it remotely. We wanted to have a, an exploit where we could uh, run it over the network on these students and get system um, level access. So that's kind of when we uh, started to dive into one of the local privilege escalations on the previous slide was the chat feature. And while we were looking in that, we, we started to notice that it was, um, quite a bit more feature complete than we thought. Uh, and one of the, it kind of reminded us also of while we were downloading the free trial, there was in the change log, um, clearly a problem before where if the student opened a document sent from the teacher, it would um, also launch a system. So they've had problems in the past there, as well as knowing that you can actually send documents uh, over this chat feature. And, and whenever an attacker can kind of uh, drop files on a, their target is kind of uh, a good sign. So we, we started to divert our attention a little bit to this chat feature, which, like I mentioned before, was way more feature complete than I thought. I thought it was just going to be a dumb, um, you know, instant messenger. But one of the things that it could do actually was the teacher can remotely view the student's file directories. <laughs> um, and so that was quite interesting in itself. Um, kind of weird that they added that to the chat feature. But um, so this is showing the student three here. Uh, the teacher can browse the like the, the my documents folder of that student. Um, they can't really like traverse. There's no dot dot directory, so they can't traverse back up to like the C drive, for instance. But um, they can still view, you know, and delete and copy files from that PC remotely. Um, so. We, so this was you know, on the real teacher client. Um, so we wanted to see if we could maybe emulate that or see how, what privileges, for instance, the chat client was being ran at it. Was it being dropped to the student um, or was it also being ran as like system, uh, all of these file operations run as system as well. And that's when we found that <laughs> the, teach, the, that uh, the chat application was actually performing all of its file operations as system. So it wasn't dropping privileges to the logged in user or the student. Um, and then right at the end, it's just pretty much ch modding 777, whatever file it, <laughs> it either wrote or uh, accessed. So um, not the best, honestly. <laughs> but uh, so that was actually our highest, um, uh, uh, highest CVSS score uh, in our and our final finding of the on this project were incorrect default permissions. So um, through that, there um, theoretically could be a way where a, a an attacker could have remote file uh, system access with system level access. So really, no files off limits at that point, uh, where they could read, write, and delete files on the, the remotely. So we wanted to take advantage of that. Um, and see if we could add that to our Python script. But the first thing we needed to really figure out was how to get past their, their My Documents folder, for instance. Um, and that's kind of when we found this convoluted path where um, we actually found that through like the options menu, this teacher can actually remotely set which path the chat feature uh, on the student 
is actually um, like the root the root folder of that. So at this point, we could just change it to the C drive or whatnot, and um, pretty much have system level access on uh, the the student machine being able to access any file we really wanted to. Um, so thinking like an attacker again, we, if we wanted to get actually uh, remote code execution with that privilege escalation, uh, what we decided to do is overwrite a system binary that we would knew would be executed with the privileges we wanted. Um, and since we know that all of the other uh, NetApp plugins that the student um, uh, has installed all get executed a system, if we actually change this work file path to the install directory of this, this software, <laughs> we can overwrite one of the plugins and then kind of just execute it through normal emulation. And that's kind of what we did. And I'll kind of show you some of the Python uh, code a little bit to uh, help uh, maybe explain it a little bit better. So this is the uh, hack the planets with uh, system level privileges uh, function. And the first thing we do is we um, you know, just scan on the network for five seconds, like you saw in the last demo. And then we get a curated list of all of the, um, the targets. So then we um, enumerate through each of the targets. Um, and the first thing we do is we start this. The chat function is similar to that of the main binary, where uh, the teacher is actually the listening socket. So we start a, a listening socket for the chat feature. Um, and then we send the broadcast telling the students to connect to us. Um, we grab those three unique tokens that we showed earlier. Um, and then we finish the handshake. So there's the other 10 packets in the handshake. Um, and then the mchat join there is in the background, um, emulating how the teacher can change that root working directory. It's changing it to the install directory of NetOp. It's deleting one of the plugins and then saving a file uh, with the same name as that plugin, a, a binary. Uh, we can call it malware for here. Um, and then pretty much just exiting out. And then um, here, the, the, the binary that we overwrote is the screenshot viewer, so the ssview.exe. So we, we overwrote that. And so now we're just emulating the teacher to start that screenshot viewer, which is now really our payload. And uh, then we just exit out. So to kind of show that um, live, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do another demo here where, again, the student computers are all around the top and the attackers down here. What I'm kind of show here is just that, you know, there's, there's a, it's a normal Windows install with all of the security turned on, kind of, again, trying to emulate the, what we would see probably out in the wild, um, most likely. Um, and then here showing that, you know, there's no teacher or anything connected. Um, and now, now we'll go into the attack script, and we'll use the same Python script as before, but this time with a dash S flag for system and a dash B for which binary we want to execute. So you'll see again that we'll scan on the, oh, this one. I didn't do the verbose mode, but it found three uh, vulnerable computers on the network. And now it's going to go through each of them and kind of start uh, executing these um, this code uh, as system. So. You'll see a little window pop up on these. That's actually the chat application saving that file. And then since we bail out pretty quick after that, um, it disappears. So you can see that the it, there would it wouldn't be a, a perfectly silent attack because the, the vision client connected and disconnected messages. But um, what we actually dropped on there was a reverse shell on each of those um, machines. So what we're doing now is just executing PowerShell remotely on one of these computers. And if we run who am I, we're actually indeed running as system. And just to kind of show a visual, we uh, ran calculator. But really, if an attacker wouldn't open a GUI application like that, um, and uh, they would probably just you know, leave it as a command line. But um, there's really no way for the student to identify visually unless they open up like the process explorer um, to see you know, that we have a remote persistent uh, system level uh, reverse shell running on all of these computers. So, um, yeah, and then the last one here, we'll, we'll open up Notepad for, for just something different. So to kind of highlight on some of the impacts of that, um, uh, one, one thing that we identified was that it could potentially be wormable. And I know that's a scary word and, and a lot of um, 
<laughs> uh, in the security field. Um, but theoretically, a well-designed malware, instead of running a calculator or whatever I showed in the, or a reverse shell in the last demo, we could actually have made malware where it just lies dormant until it finds these other broadcasts from the students. Like I said before, these get broadcast out periodically, quite frequently, and um, they have really everything um, the software would need to know to identify for one that it's this software because it has a unique um, uh, magic um, token, you know, in the beginning, and then as well as everything it would need to do to create a list of these targets. Um, the other thing that we uh, kind of theorized was that since it is running a system, um, you know, there's really nothing that's off limits to that. We could um, turn on webcams, microphones, um, and since it's running, you know, high, like the highest privileges on the Windows PC, we could really do anything at that point. And to bring it back down, back to the COVID-19 exceptions, um, we, I, this is kind of when the students bring these devices off the network, they could get compromised at like a coffee shop or a local, um, uh, the library or whatever. And um, as soon as they bring these devices back to the network, uh, the school network, they could potentially further the spread. So um, that was kind of what we thought of uh, while while looking at the uh, the impact of this uh, these handful of um, CVEs. And then, so in total, we found like two critical issues, which we covered here: um, four local privilege escalations, which I briefly highlighted, um, and then three instances of plain text sensitive data like the screenshots and the Windows credentials. We also, since we had the scapey layers um, all made up, uh, we actually started to just do some rudimentary fuzzing of those. Um, and so we found actually like six crashes uh, that didn't seem quite exploitable. Um, and But we also had a, a path of least resistance with how I showed here. So um, we disclosed all of these to the vendor um, and they were actually quite responsive. Um, and got it all patched up in the latest version, 9.7.2. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, we like to highlight on is our advanced threat research team always follows a 90-day disclosure period. So we found this actually on 12-11-2020, and it was publicly released on 3-21 um, after we uh, validated their, their patch. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks again for um, tuning into my talk. I'll be sticking around for some questions. And if you want to see some more details with more screenshots and things like that, feel free to log into our um, advanced threat research uh, blog here. There's this research and quite a few other research topics that um, we all we all think are cool. So um, and if you need to reach me on email or Twitter, those are my, um, my handles there. But uh, yeah, let me um, move back over to the window. Stop presenting and yeah i'll be here for any questions cool thanks sam that was a yeah. great talk thanks um let's see if scanning general let's see looks like there's some typing going on so maybe we have some questions cool um i'm curious while we're waiting to see if uh mm -hmm. do you when you go through that interaction with the vendor uh, reporting reporting findings and then um, and then having a patch to review is did, uh, you don't I mean I don't, I don't know how if it's appropriate to talk about specific cases but in general do you find that there's back and forth or do you find like they get it right the first time with patches yeah so that's always a, a hard one is um, uh, the the back and forth because theoretically you know a new patch it means new code and so it it, it would, uh, a lot of times we, we kind of validate the patch um, and see if there's any like really easy things to identify that they did wrong. But um, we don't do a full audit again because then it would be, you know, an indefinite project usually. But um, so uh, we, we try to do our best though. And, and the vendors that are um, very back and forth or uh, really communicative um, are, are great to work with because we can actually help them along the way. It's kind of the worst when, um, you disclose something, you don't hear back, and then like two days before, you know, we were, we're planning on releasing it, they go, "Hey, we fixed it. Can you check it?" And then if they have a mistake, they're like, "What do we do?" You know, <laughs> like so yeah. the ones that like start working with us because we we always offer that, you know, we're like, "Hey, if you guys have any questions or anything, like 
want our code, you know, our, our exploit code, like feel free to ask for it. And those, those, those always work much better. <laughs> for the, uh, uh, I, some of the crashes you found with fuzzing, um, are those things that, uh, that you will kind of like put away to like check out later now that um, like these findings have been disclosed or is that kind of like, yeah, it's good enough for now. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of, that's another hard one is um, usually uh, because we have the opportunity to look at so many products, like usually if we get like root or system, a lot of the times we, we start to lose interest. Cause you know, like we, we found the, the, the Holy grail, you know, but um, so we actually are going back and looking at some of those now. Um, we're actually going to try to do a like a potentially like a training internally with with this product, you know, um, cool. because we we've already built so much infrastructure with it and stuff. So um, it's a uh, we are going back through it, but um, I'm not saying that's always the case though. <laughs> Sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. the new squirrel or you know the, the new <laughs> target, you know, that's yeah. <laughs> Cool. Okay. Uh, we and we actually do have some uh, some questions in the channel, so I'll switch to those. Uh, uh, so UrbanSec asks uh, first says, "There's the great talk. Uh, can you go into more detail about how your sniffing approach is affected by different network architectures?" And they say, for example, switched Ethernet versus WEP Wi-Fi versus WPA2 Wi-Fi. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think theoretically. As soon as you connect over, like for Wi-Fi, in, in, uh, for instance, as soon as you are connected to the network, the um, the connection method or the security involved to, to get connected actually doesn't play any role. There, and then like um, so, the promiscuous mode that I mentioned is how uh, for Wi-Fi, for instance, how you would actually capture network traffic that's not intended for your machine, and that's actually just um, that is getting broadcast out over the network anyway. Um, and most uh, NICs just reject it because it doesn't have their signature. But promiscuous mode is actually a CPU. So it, it bypasses the NIC and actually um, uses the CPU to identify which packet is its. And it, at, at that point, you can tell, oh, all packets are mine. So then it consumes them and you can view them in Wireshark or whatever. Um, on the Ethernet, I. Um, I think it's the same. I, I don't know if you even need to put it in promiscuous mode. I, I might be wrong on that, but um, I don't actually think that uh, unless you do some network seg uh, segregation where it's like VLANs or whatever, that any sort of network would be able to like prevent against the plain text sniffing of traffic. And that's kind of why um, you know HTTPS and stuff came along is um, they identified this as just a flaw in networks. <laughs> Cool, thanks. Uh, so Aaron asks uh, if you were able to find any vulnerabilities uh, the other way. Uh, so I think he's talking about for going from the student application to the teacher. Yeah, so um, that's what uh, I, I've, I've gotten that question a lot and I, I'm bummed that I didn't actually enumerate that. You know, I was so stoked from the, <laughs> the student one that we never actually went back to the, the teacher, but um, there, there potentially could be. Um, we didn't look into it though um, as, thoroughly uh, because the teacher client is running as the teacher we thought that getting the student uh, the system level access on the student was more impactful um, so we, we kind of decided to focus on that but um, yeah that's a really good good question cool. thanks uh, see so we have another one from punk coder uh, do you think these class of applications all have similar attack surfaces or do you think this application was an anomaly so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I can't speak for all of them because I haven't looked at them, but uh, I do think a lot of these softwares, um, they are designed in a way that they they never really potential, I don't know for sure, but like it, it seems that they don't really expect them to leave the, the walled garden of a secure network, um, for instance. So that's kind of why uh, we usually wouldn't have um, potentially looked at this product uh, as thorough, thoroughly <laughs> uh, because uh, we, we like to try to find, you know, the, the internet based attacks and the, the things that you, you hear on, you know, the news like the, <laughs> um, but since this one, you know, there is a lot of changes going on with now, you know, hybrid learning could become a, a, a de facto and things like that. So I, I think, um, we always go back to if vendors can build in security from the ground up, it's much easier than trying to tack it on later. 
um, because they didn't think of a scenario where now their software is being used. So um, I, I can't really speak for other um, school software, but I would probably assume that there's many others that are similar to this. Yeah, that makes sense. The, uh, let's see, we have another question from uh, Yauza asking uh, how many students use this software. So I guess an idea of just how prolific this particular. Yeah, so the, that's, that's a really hard, like we always try to find the details on that um, kind of thing. And um, it, it's really hard unless they have like, a, they brag about it on their, their, their website or whatever. Um, and the NetOp actually was one of those that did brag about it. And in one of my previous, one of my first few slides, uh, I think there was around six million teachers and students. I don't know if that means like uh, each one is a one of the million, or or if, you know one. I don't know. So they, they, that's what they claimed: six million teachers and students. So um, potentially six million installs. I don't really know. It's it's hard to get those numbers, but uh, whenever we do, we 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 try to, you know, we don't just go out and ask them usually. <laughs> I wish we could. Cool. Thanks very much for that talk. That was, uh, yeah, super informative. Yeah. I, Excellent. I like those, yeah. yeah. Technical deep dives. Cool. Um, cool. I don't think we have any more questions. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone's watching, please. Uh, the questions are coming from Discord. So feel free to join the, the link.